Hey guys, welcome to the house. We are so glad that you decided to come back this Tuesday night. Uh, if you're new here, my name is Ryan. It's a privilege to be with you. Um, I have the privilege of leading this ministry along with a lot of other awesome leaders and teachers, and uh, you're in good hands with your group leaders. Um, last week, one of our awesome group leaders, Bryce, um, taught, and uh, it was a privilege just to sit under his teaching, and uh, he did a great job with the end of John 2. Tonight we're going to be, um, and I encourage you to go back and watch that message, uh, we're going to be starting John 3 tonight. Probably a familiar um, passage to you if you grew up in church, um, but I'm going to go ahead and read it and get us started. So, John chapter 3, um, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered, Truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly I say to you, one, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do you not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again? The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you don't understand these things? Truly I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you don't receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you don't believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. And this is God's word. All right, so the new birth. Um, maybe you've heard of uh, the term being born again. Um, I actually was thinking back to, uh, it might not have been the last election, maybe the one before, but um, I think I was watching CNN or something on election night. And it's funny when they, they always pull up this big map of the US and they go to like different states and counties to like show the, val uh, the vote tally. And um, one of the, sometimes they'll um, focus on certain groups within that county. And one of the groups uh, was born again evangelical Christians. <laughs> and so um, it's just even funny that CNN uh, and, you know, it's that mainstream that that term um, has gone around in our country. And so uh, anyway, maybe like what they're kind of doing, maybe you think of a specific kind of person uh, when you think of the term born again. Um, if you grew up in the South, um, you grew up going to church, maybe you think of, oh, someone who's born again is somebody who goes to church, or somebody who's super religious, or um, somebody who's had a you know, drastic conversion, right? Maybe it's somebody like that. So maybe you have these sort of um, p t kinds of people that you think of when you hear that term. But what I want to do tonight is see how we can understand what Jesus means by being born again. And I think we get a lot of um, a, a lot of context by who he's speaking to in this guy named Nicodemus. So um, we're going to break this down in three sections. What it is, what is the new birth, how it happens, and what it gives. Okay. So um, Nicodemus, as it says, was a ruler of the Jews, which means he was a member of the Sanhedrin Council. Um, and they... Uh, you know, held trials and made decisions regarding uh, things going on in, in Jerusalem. So he was a, a Pharisee. He was a teacher of the law. 
Um, he had a lot of influence, a lot of wealth, because as we found out last week, a lot of the religious leaders did really well, um, money-wise. Uh, he had knowledge. You know, he um, Pharisees had to know the Old Testament and the law really, really well. Um, and so, yeah, he, he was a typical um, Pharisee, although I will say it's interesting. He calls Jesus rabbi here, okay? Um, and that's interesting to me because a lot of a big criticism from the Pharisees and from the religious leaders about Jesus was that he wasn't formally trained, right? He was kind of just this guy who came in from Nazareth, um, who nobody had ever ever heard of. He wasn't trained in Jerusalem like they were, um, and so they were kind of confused. That's why they were they were always asking him, "Where do you get this authority from?" Like you weren't trained here. Um, so anyway, I just think it's interesting that he shows him respect and calls him rabbi. Um, so he calls him teacher. And even though um, he doesn't have this sort of stamp of approval from the leaders in Jerusalem, he even says we. He says, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs unless God is with him. So he doesn't say I know. He says we. So it's almost like he's representing this group of some of the leaders in Jerusalem, like, okay, we can see the signs he's doing and we can see that this is from God. So we want to learn from him. We want to, we just want to understand what he's about and see if we can benefit from him, honestly. Um, see what, see what he can do for us in a way. Um, but just in case he's like completely crazy, he comes by night, right? It says he comes to Jesus by night. So he's like, I don't want people seeing this, but I, I just wanna come see what this guy's about. Um, so he says, uh, how can a man, so Jesus says, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom. And Nicodemus is like, how can somebody be born when he's old? Um, and he said, and then Jesus replies and says, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Okay, so my, my question is, what is being born again? What is the new birth? Well, does new birth mean more religion? Does it mean moral reformation from, uh, from within? Is it, doing so, is it changing up the way you do things, right? Well, no, it can't mean that because Jesus doesn't say, hey, Moses gave you the Ten Commandments. Here's ten more. This is how you get into the kingdom of God. This is how you enter the kingdom is you got to do these commandments. You got to do more stuff. He doesn't say that, right? So it can't mean more religion. Does new birth mean more like a spiritual vitamin, like a multivitamin? You got to like, okay, you're doing good things, but like you got to just do some more or do something slightly different. You just need a little boost, right? It can't mean that either because... Nicodemus was, by all accounts, because he was a Pharisee, because he was a teacher, he was a very moral guy, <laughs> right? Um, honestly, he was among the spiritual elite in Jerusalem. And Jesus doesn't say, hey, you know what? You're really close, Nicodemus. You're like, you're, you're almost to the kingdom. Like, you're so close. You just got to do some more things. He doesn't say that. He says to this man who had a ton of moral religion, who uh, spent his whole life and career in ministry, he tells him nothing he's done up to this point counts. That's a bombshell, right? And honestly, we can kind of sympathize with Nicodemus a little bit. Because just imagine, you're literally giving your whole life to being a Pharisee, teaching the law, being among the spiritual elite, you're like trying to kind of climb the ladder in Jerusalem and then literally just flattened by this guy from Nazareth who you think is from God. And he's like, yeah, nothing you've done counts. <laughs> you got to be completely born again. It would be jarring, right? Um, so here's one thing I think we do have in common with Nicodemus and then one thing we don't. One thing we don't have in common is I think we can all agree, Nicodemus was probably a better guy than us in terms of just morality. Like, in terms of keeping the law, he knew the Old Testament better than we would have. Um, he was born in Jewish culture, so he had the right pedigree, the right family. Um, and yet, 
it's such good news that Jesus, for us, who are not as moral as he is, it's such good news that Jesus is telling this man, you have to be born again from scratch. Um, that's good news for us. Now, here's one thing we uh, do have in common with him. So that's one thing we don't have in common that's good for us. Um, the fact that it really doesn't matter that he's spent his whole life learning Jew or being a part of Jewish culture, teaching the law, it doesn't matter. He's not even close. He's got to be born again. But one thing we do have in common with him is I think, honestly, if we just are being real with ourselves, we kind of don't think we're that bad of people. Like, we just don't. Like, we, we, especially like you grow up in the South, you go to church, you go to youth group, you, you know, you, you, yeah, you mess up every once in a while, but like, you know, I mean, I'm not a murderer, right? <laughs> like, I don't, I'm, I, <laughs> there are worse people than me, quote unquote. Um, and so we genuinely don't think we're that sinful. And I think we do have that in common with Nicodemus, that um, I think he, he just doesn't really think he's that sinful, and so he just thinks he needs some more stuff to do. Um, and that's how we are. Um, but the question is, according to whose standard are we good? Right? Like, what, because I'm better than my neighbor? Like, that makes me a good person? No, the true standard of goodness is who our creator is. The true standard of goodness is who God is. He's perfectly holy. He decides um, what, what matters is his standard, not mine or yours, right? So what is the new birth? It's being given a completely new nature. It's being given something that our human nature is incapable of doing on its own. It's something completely outside of ourselves. The answer to the problem of sin is not more moral effort or moral reformation. It's not just changing something that I'm not doing or doing. The answer to my problem of sin is something completely outside of myself. And that's what Jesus is telling Nicodemus. You need something completely new. You, you need something that you don't have right now and you are incapable of doing on your own or getting on your own. You need something from above, okay? Now, before we move on, verse five has created a lot of interpretation um, or a lot of different interpretations. And uh, it's when Jesus says, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he can't enter the kingdom. And we don't have time to go through all the different interpretations, so I'll just share what mine is. Um, some people read that and they say, oh, well, water, that's a metaphor for baptism, water baptism. So, you, so, so you gotta, in order to be in the kingdom, you got to be water baptized and have the Holy Spirit. Well, the problem with that is he doesn't say baptism, <laughs> okay? He doesn't even mention baptism in this whole passage. And we know that John's not afraid to talk about baptism because he just spent chapter one, he talked about John the Baptist, right? And his baptism of, the, of water. So John's not afraid to talk about baptism. Why would he not mention it here if he was talking about that? Um, all he talks about in this passage is the work of the Spirit, the work of the Son, the work of God, right? So I just, I don't see the, the connection of baptism here, um, water baptism. Um, here's what I think Jesus is saying. There's two Old Testament passages that um, I think he's alluding to. Um, one main one in Ezekiel 36. The other is Jeremiah 31. God talks about the new covenant that he's going to make um, or that he's going to bring. And um, Ezekiel 36, um, so we're not going to read these passages, but I just think it's good for you to know them and, and read them yourselves. Um, in Ezekiel 36, God explains how he's going to make Israel holy. Okay, And they have to be holy because, as we've talked about thus far in John, if you want to be in a covenant with God who is holy, you have to be holy. And so God in Ezekiel 36 says, I'm going to make Israel holy for my name's sake, for my covenant's sake, for my people's sake. And he's not going, and, and he says in Ezekiel 36, he's going to do it. Not us. He's going to spr sprinkle clean water on us in verse 25, or, or on Israel. And he's going to give, a new, uh, give them a new heart and put his spirit within them in verse 27. So I think the most plain answer is the, 
the best answer, which is Jesus is simply alluding to what God said he was going to do. The new birth is about being cleansed by God. The new birth is about being cleansed by something outside of yourself. It's something he does. It's not something we do. It's something that he does. So I think Jesus is alluding to being cleansed by the Spirit. Okay? All right, so we got it. What is the new birth? It's being born again. <laughs> it's literally starting from scratch. It's, it's, give, it's being given something completely outside of yourself that you don't have right now. Okay? So how does it happen? Well, we speed on ahead to verse 13, and Jesus says, No one has ascended into heaven except the one, except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So this almost seems like, like a sidebar here, um, but what Jesus does is he references a little passage in Numbers 21 where the Israelites are in the wilderness and they're being attacked by these fiery serpents <laughs> um, and they're dying. Um, and they're, you know, dying probably of poison and sickness and fever and all this sort of stuff. And so God tells Moses, make a serpent out of, a bron out of bronze, put it on a pole and hold it up for them to look at and they'll be healed. Literally, they don't have to crawl there and touch it. They don't have to do it. They just literally have to look at it and they're saved, they're healed. So um, Jesus says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So he's referencing himself being lifted up on the cross and the way that you are born again is by looking at him and being saved. So imagine, Numbers 21, Israelites are on the ground dying of, you know, poison and being bitten, can't move, paralyzed. And God tells Moses, hey, let me give you some new rules. Write down how they're going to be, uh, how, they're, how, how to get the venom out of their arms, um, how to like make sure it doesn't happen again, how to heal themselves on their own. Write those things down and tell them. Okay, I mean, that would have been okay, I guess, but they're dying and <laughs> they're on the ground dying, right? And so Jesus's point is, you're dying of your sin. You don't need more rules to save yourself. You need a savior. That's the point. That's how you're born again, is the new birth happens by you looking at me on the cross and taking your place, taking your condemnation that you deserved. That's how you become born again. So you see, Nicodemus' problem and our problem, for those who are not yet Christians, if you're not born again, if you're not a Christian yet, it's because you're still looking at Jesus as just a teacher. You're looking at Jesus as a religious teacher to tell you things of how to be a good person. And that's not ultimately who he is. He's a savior. You aren't seeing Jesus how he came to be seen, which is to be a savior. Now, he does become your teacher if he's your savior. You do learn from him. He's your rabbi. He's your master. But only if he's your savior. And I think a lot of people flip it around, and that's why they don't, they're not born again. A uh, good example of this, similar to Nicodemus, actually, is Martin Luther. Martin Luther was an Augustinian monk in the 1500s. He was literally a priest. Um, and he was very much like Nicodemus in that he taught people the Bible, and yet he wasn't converted. Unfortunately, um, there are people, uh, not just in churches all over the place, um, who have been going to church their whole lives. There are people in ministry. There are people in positions like I have who are not yet converted, who are not born again, because they still see Jesus as just a teacher. And Martin Luther was similar, and he uh, was studying Romans 117, which says, For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. And he said this about this verse, similarly to Nicodemus. And Jesus tells Nicodemus, go look at this verse. 
Uh, Martin Luther says, I labored diligently and anxiously as to how to understand Paul's word in Romans 1.17, where he says, the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. I took it to mean that that righteousness, whereby God punishes the unrighteous, and I had no confidence that my own heart could possibly assuage him or my merit. He was still trying to say, God, I have to, he thought that meant, I, I, I'm going to be punished for my unrighteousness and I have to persuade God to uh, assuage his wrath against me by my own merit. And he says, then I grasped that the righteousness of God is that righteousness which through grace and sheer mercy, God gives to us through Christ in faith. Listen to this. Thereupon I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise when I saw the difference that law is one thing and the gospel is another. I broke through. That's a picture of somebody being born again. And that caused the Protestant Reformation. <laughs> I mean, other factors, but that was a major factor. So it's exactly what Jesus is telling Nicodemus. Nicodemus, you're still seeing me as a teacher. You're not seeing me as a Lord and a Savior that's come to give you salvation by grace, by believing in me. To be born again, how it happens is repentance and faith. And I'm sure you're like, well, I've heard that my whole life. Well, repentance is not just feeling sorry about your sins. Repentance is saying, Lord, I not only repent of all the bad things that I've done, I repent of all the bad reasons of trying to do my good things. Of all, the, of all the bad reasons and bad motivations and sinful motivations to try to earn your favor, to think that I could ever earn, your sal earn salvation before you on my own. You have to repent of that too. It's not just repenting of the bad things you've done. It's trying to, um, repenting of trying to control God, trying to just get things from him. I'm gonna do good so I can get something from you. That's not the new birth. The new birth is spiritual bankruptcy. The new birth is completely surrendering all of it and repenting of all of it, including your religion, and seeing Christ as your Lord and to only be saved by His grace and what He's done for you. That's the new birth. That's how it happens. So what does it give you? You probably heard this verse a million times. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. So they're still under condemnation. If you are still trying to save yourself, you are still under condemnation. You are still under law because you have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. The light of the world has come into the world. And people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. So, um, what happens? What does the new birth gives you? Well, number one, it gives you new senses. <laughs> it gives you new life. It gives you, when a baby is born, ask yourself this, how much work did you have to do to be born? The answer is none. Somebody did do a lot of work. <laughs> your, your mom <laughs> did a lot of work, right? A lot of labor. Um, you did nothing to be born. It's something that happens to you. And when it happens, when you see the gospel, when you believe the gospel, when you see Jesus for who he is, when the lights come on, you literally, it's like you see things for the first time. You see things that you never saw before. You hear things differently. You uh, taste, your, your desires change. Augustine said, um, when he became born again, it's like the, re the order of his loves were reordered, right? It's like Christ, the love for Christ came to the top. And again, it's not that you still don't sin and you still don't fall into idolatry, but it's you've tasted the Lord. You've tasted that he's good. You've tasted what he did for you and you taste that he loves you. You sense it. You experience it. It's literally 
um, new sensibility. Um, and then uh, obviously what the transactional thing that happens is you're literally transferred from one kingdom to another. You're, tra you're transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of Christ. You are literally transferred from one to another. Um, Paul says in Colossians 3, if you then have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things of the earth. Uh, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So literally, you are in Christ if you've been born again. You are united to him. You've been given a new nature. You've been given a, you are literally a new person. So what is the evidence that you've been born again? Well, whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Um, so uh, I'll give you an example. Let's say, uh, so let's say my phone is broken. I don't know about y'all, but I really don't like those software updates because I feel like they don't ever change my phone. Um, and every time I just like agree to the terms and conditions and I'm probably like signing my life away. I don't ever read it. Um, but let's say my phone is broken and I try to charge it all night. And every time I, as soon as I take it off the charger, <clears throat> As soon as I take it off the charger, it just dies. Like it's just broken, right? It's dead. And uh, a new software update comes. <laughs> um, will a software update of just adding some features and maybe fixing some bugs here and there, will that fix my phone? No, it's a dead broken phone. I need a brand new power source. I need a, because something's wrong with it. It's broken, it's dead. I need a completely new phone. I need a completely new power source. A adding some updates to a phone that's dead won't fix it. Um, and that's why the new birth isn't religion. Religion and secularism can't solve the problem, uh, problem of evil and sin. Humans can't solve the problem of evil. No amount of moral reformation will fix evil because there's evil inside of us. <laughs> that's why. So. John is not saying, uh, when he says, whoever does what is true comes to the light, he's not saying the lover of light is some superior moral person internally, but he's saying that someone being born again to walk in the light and hate their darkness is someone who understands that the new birth is from what God has done to them and through them. It's something that God does. In other words, that person's life should be, should be so changed by the gospel internally that their heart transformation leads to a completely new external life. It's changed from within. It's God coming into your life, changing your heart, and then, then your hands change. It's not changing your hands, okay? Changing of hands will come. External behavior does change in the new birth, but the root of the change is from what God has done for you, from what your the gospel changes your internal motivations because you've been given a new heart and a new spirit. And now you go and love and serve people and follow Jesus from having a transformed heart. So the question for all of us tonight, based on this passage, is pretty simple. Have you been born again? Have you been coming to church all your life and you still think Jesus came to give you more rules to do in order to gain favor with him? Or do you look at him? Do you look at him on the cross being condemned on your behalf? He was without sin and yet became sin. The sin of your sin, if you believe in him, was put on him and died. Do you believe that that happened for you? Do you trust in Jesus alone? Or are you still trying to believe in Jesus and work your way to salvation? Um, there's a really interesting reference that Jesus uses, and we'll end here, in John 16. He, uh, he identifies the night before he's crucified with a woman going into labor. And I think this just speaks to the new birth. And he says in verse 21 of John 16, when a woman is giving birth, 
She has sorrow because her hour has come, but when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So what's Jesus doing? He's identifying um, at, with a woman in labor for what he's about to go through on the cross. And in those times, uh, when before the gift of common grace from God in modern medicine, a lot of women used to lose their lives giving birth. And so that even carries more weight to what Jesus is saying. He's not saying, I'm just about to go through a painful thing and through anguish. But at the cost of his life, he still goes to the cross knowing that joy in new life is going to happen. His, through his death, life is going to be brought forth to those who would believe in him. And so my question to you is, are you still seeing Jesus just as a teacher? Or do you look at the cross and you say, Jesus, I repent of thinking that I could ever do what you came to do. I repent of ever thinking that I could assuage God's wrath on my own. And I, I flee to you. My works are filthy rags. The only works that are going to make me righteous are Jesus' works. Do you trust in him alone? That's the question. Love you guys. We'll see you next week.